Okay, good uh, morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you for being part of this Kinematic March, um, which will be four sessions uh, each Tuesday at 10 a.m. Colorado time, which is uh, noon on the eastern uh, part of the United States. Um, I'm going to uh, present the first one, which is the vehicle damage aspect uh, that are, and the performance of the car that are influenced by kinematics. The next three sessions will be presented by Ariel Avi, who is a, an Optimum G engineer. He will speak about how to use a kinematic software, then the force model, and then the optimization. Because until a few months ago, uh, Optimum Kinematics, for example, was able to tell you uh, what were your camber variation, uh, your accurate man, your roll center movement, your motion ratio with uh, given points, but it didn't tell you where the pickup point had to be. That's what we call uh, optimization. So let's go straight away. We are going to speak about uh, wheelbases and track um, uh, definition, uh, scrub radius and mechanical trail, and caster and KPI angle. So two and three are about uh, two of the pickup points uh, on the uh, upright, the third one being for the tolling. Um, we're going to speak about outboard pickup points. That's what it is on the uh, on the upright. Uh, the front view virtual swing axle, the instant center position, and the roll center all goes together. Same thing view from the side, side virtual swing axle, position of the instant center, and pitch center position also. Um, inboard wishbone pickup point. So we will go now uh, trying to define where you want to have you pick up on the chassis. Um, then we're going to speak about steering rack, inboard and outboard tolling position, which means that inevitably that will influence your bump steer and your Ackerman. Um, the spring and the end your bar motion ratio. And then uh, we'll speak about integration of the kinematic with the vehicle design. And then we will give you some, uh, I would say, 90% of the passenger car. These are decided already. First of all, because you cannot make cars which are three, we, uh, three meter wide. And because depending if you are in class A, class B car, mm, these dimensions are probably, probably uh, very much decided. Um, but... Uh, in racing, things are a little bit different. You have to con consider the inertia, the circuit you are running over. I mean, is it fast circuit? Is it tight circuit? Um, uh, the driver skills, uh, the tire characteristics, obviously, the rules, uh, all the templates and so on, uh, the weight target, because obviously a long car will be heavier than a short car, and the downforce and the possible rollover. And when I say the downforce is important, a few years ago in Formula 1, the uh, ma maximum width of the car was uh, 200 millimeters shorter than it was now. So the track was about 200 millimeters shorter front and rear than it is now. And guess what? They had so much downforce that the difference in the weight transfer was not making a big difference. But anyway, so um, let's speak about that first. When you speak about a Formula One, you need to know that the diffuser is doing 60% of the downforce and the front wing and the rear wing about 20%. Uh, things are going to be even more for the diffuser this year. And, uh, in, F1, and in IndyCar at Indianapolis, you have about 85% of the downforce coming from the underway. So that's not negligible. So um, if you take a Formula One, the maximum... Uh, wheelbase, oh, there is a, a, a little yellow line, I'm not in the right position here, but um, which is uh, 3600 millimeter, 3.6 meter. So the good news is that uh, you have a maximum of the downforce uh, created by uh, the long underwing. No, the negative is that necessarily the weight and the yaw inertia, things about tight circuit. So uh, a lot of your inertia improves the stability, but re reduce the response. 
And uh, when you go on a circuit like Monaco, for example, uh, it's going to be difficult. Now, uh, the minimum wheelbase for a Formula student, for example, is 15.25. So the short wheelbase has an advantage. First, the weight, because the cheapest way to make a light car is to make a small car. And then the inertia. Um, in Formula student circuit do not demand a high stability, but they demand, they demand a lot of response. And the best proof of that is that you have go kart which are way smaller and way lighter, and the driver can still uh, maneuver the car in, with good confidence. So that means that for a Formula student, um, your inertia has to be at the minimum. Um, I do not understand why a Formula student team would design a car with a wheelbase longer than 1528. I'll give you three millimeter more. Uh, just uh, for the safety there, or ju just to be sure you are passing uh, the rules, uh, the technical inspection. Uh, another thing, let me give you a little example here. I, I take a car with McPherson, and I made simply uh, four times three kilo for the call over, so spring plus damper and so on, and I calculated the inertia versus the center of gravity. Okay, I made my life easier. I put the center of gravity in the middle here, and I have 31.2 kilometers square of the inertia. And um, we're going to consider the same weight, whether you have Push Road or McPherson and so on. So now if you take a double AR, look at that. What I made is making sure that the front damper are to the rear of the front axle and the rear damper are on the front of the rear axle. And then look at that. The inertia is now 20.3 instead of, what did we have? 31.2. So the difference is 35% less inertia. And that's the goal, that if you are looking for a Formula student, you, the, the three things that needs to be uh, achieved are the lightest car, uh, the lowest CG, and the min minimum your inertia. Because in Formula student, you are using Mickey Mouse circuit there that stability is really an issue. Uh, you need to enter the corner and the maximum speed is very low compared to many other racing circuit for race car. I'm going to give you another example. This is uh, an engine and this is for non-suspended non mass. And look at that. I calculated the uh, distance between uh, the center of gravity here and the engine center of gravity, the non-suspended mass and the distance between the front suspended mass and the CG, one meter and 0 0.9. Why? Because uh, the, weight, the weight distribution is slightly more to the uh, rear. And look at that. I calculate the yaw inertia of one front suspended mass, one rear, all four of them, so twice 8.4 and twice 7.0, and the inertia of the engine. An engine of 50 kilo. So four non-suspended mass of nine kilo contribute to the U inertia 15 times more than a 50 kilo engine. Obviously, the worst contribute to the U inertia are the wings because they're even further away uh, than the wheels. All right. Um, let's speak about the outboard pickup point, which is caster angle mechanical trail, KPI angle scrub radius. So when you have here, uh, when you design your pride, of course, the caster or the mechanical trail or the square bridges have been exaggerated for the sake of the, um, the visualization. Uh, normally, with that much offset, the car would be very difficult to drive. Um, the choice of the funnel pride and KPI uh, caster and angle and trail will influence four important things. Number one, the ride height change in steering. And if you have a one or two millimeter of difference could make a serious difference in terms of aerodynamic uh, uh, behavior because on race car, the, the ride height is extremely sensitive um, and influence the downforce and the downforce distribution in the drive. Then the camber variation in steering. Then the steering wheel torque. And then the cross weight in steering, which is very, very important. This is something that a lot of people are ignoring. And I'm already going to give you two pieces of advice. You want at most 10 Newton meter of torque at the steering wheel, at most. If you take a passenger car, 
it's rarely uh, going over five newton meter and it has power steering so if you come with 20 newton meter of torque and steering wheel mamma mia you're gonna have to uh, uh, send your driver to the um, gym very often and then uh, you want this kingpin axis to uh, cross the tire roughly at the center uh, you're going to tell me, yeah, but Claude, there is no steering torque on the rear. Yeah, there is no steering torque, correct, except that the torque that will be created by the FX or the FY multiplied by the offset will put a big load on the tolling. So you will need a, a bigger tube, bigger road end, and more um, a bigger tube or stiffer monocoque for the inboard part of the tolling. So I <clears throat> be careful with that. All right. Uh, so let me give you an example here. Uh, that's pretty scary uh, when you see the um, <clears throat> uh, the uh, the camber on the outside wheel there. And the question is that is that okay? If you have a tire model, <clears throat> I would be very surprised that uh, the tire model tell you that the best camber is positive. Hmm? I, I, I might doubt some. Tires are more, some are less sensitive to camber, but <clears throat> you really have more grip with positive. And the question I have is that, is this, uh, a, uh, the reason for that, is it a part of kinematic or a part of compliance, okay, uh, for this big camber? So, uh, I want you to know that, uh, let's speak about camber variation here. If you have a large mechanical trail, it's going to be a lot of torque on the steering wheel but you're going to have a lot of camber variation. On the other end, if you have a small mechanical trail, you are not going to have a lot of camber variation, but uh, it, you will be uh, less torque in the steering wheel. Well, guess what? It's possible to have the best of both worlds by having a small mechanical trail and a large caster angle. Nobody told you that the kingpin axis had to go through the center of the wheel except for front wheel drive when when you steer the wheel in the paddock if you have a, a bigger angle between the drive shaft and the uh, uh the hub axis you are going to have uh i have it there, yeah uh you are going to have um an angle and you could hear the uh cv john tac 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 you know but that's an exception okay this is an example of the uh, vertical load that you have on the uh, on the uh, tires and you see that's interesting that when you turn left for example the vertical load increase uh on the uh, when you turn left yeah the vertical load increase on the inside decrease on the outside and it's interesting that we have a diagonal weight transfer because when you increase the load on the left front sorry left front you increase the load also on the right way when you decrease the load on the uh, right front you decrease it on the left rear and it's not negligible because when you look at this we have about 24 70 something like that and if you turn the wheel 95 degrees uh, no 90 degree uh, you go from uh, let's speak in kilo 247 to two, 262 not negligible correct and that will influence very much the real magic number uh, the TLTD uh, will be different because of that. And it's important uh, because uh, if you have weight transfer, you're in a corner. And if you're in a corner, uh, you turn the steering wheel. So inevitably, that's going to make a difference. The other one is the camber variation. Uh, usually, you have more uh, positive variation. So you, steed, you start at 2.8 and you have less and less negative. So it's a positive one. And you have a negative one on the inside wheel we are turning left and here uh, negative on the outside wheel and you will notice that there is also a camber variation on the left rear and the right wheel yeah but the reason look at the uh, scale here we are speaking about uh, uh, less than one tenth of a degree and the reason for that is that when you change the oops sorry when you change the vertical load well <laughs> you have more vertical load on the right wheel less on the left rear well, guess what? You're going to have tight deflection and a, a little bit of roll angle, uh, and therefore the camber is going to change. Um, now, 
I'm going to give you an example. This is a very good idea of what you can do with infrared temperature sensor. I'm going to give you a simple example. You have a car like this. You have the internal temperature of the right front, so this tire, 105, 90, 70. What, what's the problem? Well, you have too much camber, correct? Okay. Now you go at the apex, and the temperature is 120, 130, 150. So why is the average uh, higher? Well, uh, you're the braking zone then. You, you brake and you enter the corner, so you put more energy in the tire. So the problem is this. If I have too much um, uh, camber and I reduce the, the camber, the negative camber on the right front, I'm going to solve this problem, but I'm going to make this one even worse. Or if I put more camber, I will help with this one, but not in that one. Well, so what's the solution? Well, the solution is to have less static camber and more caster. But caster, I'm not going to go through all the formula, but a caster deeply influences the camber variation in steering. And that's even more true in a very tight corner, because guess what? On a very tight corner, you turn the steering wheel even more. And then the ride height variation in steering, they are, could be very different if you have a push road, for example, which is directly connected to the wishbone, or if you have a push road which is directly connected with the upright. And you have an example here, all the uh, straight line are with a pickup point on the A-arm, on the lower A-arm, and here they are connected with the upright. And it's not negligible because when you turn the steering wheel uh, let's say 180 degree, you go from 41 to 36 millimeters, five millimeter more, uh, unless, sorry. So I can tell you in terms of aerodynamic, that's going to make a huge difference. Positive, negative, give me your aerom up and I will tell you which ride I, a new tire model and I will tell you which ride I, you need to be in which corners. Okay. Um, then we are going to calculate the forces. So we spoke about camber variation, vertical load, um, uh, uh, right eye, and now uh, we're going to look at the steering torque. So I'm going to give you a very simple appreciation. Uh, you are going to look at uh, the KPI here. So the lateral force has a little offset uh, compared to the center of the wheel. That's going to create an MZ, MZ, but you have also the MZ from the tire itself. Then you have to consider the steering arm of uh, the upright and then you have to look at the uh, distance between the axis of the col steering column and the one of the uh, steering rack. So um, there can be steering torque uh, coming from the FY, from the FZ. Ah, yes, a car with more downforce will have more steering torque because the vertical load is as an offset compared to the uh, kingpin axis. And then you even have the FX when you brake, when you accelerate, and even the MX, uh, which is called the camber torque by some people. And then, of course, the length of the uh, steering arm and the steering rack trail, as we call it here. So I'm going to give you a simple example. So you have an example here where in blue, um, in uh, blue, you have the grip versus the slip angle. So more and more grip until you go through a maximum, and then the grip dim diminished. Then you have the one from uh, the mechanical trail, so that's the FY multi multiplied by mechanical trail, and then you have here, oh no, no, sorry, the purple one was the FY versus alpha, okay, that is the MZ, and as usually the slip angle at which you reach the MZ is smaller than the slip angle at which you reach the maximum FY. Then you have here um, the FY versus um, uh, the, pneumat the, the uh, pneumatic trail, and that is the FY versus the kinematic trail, and that is the total. So I made a calculation for you with you. I have 1984 newton meter on the outside wheel, uh, 1178 newton that I multiply by um, trail of uh, sorry, uh, uh, a steering arm of let's say 100 millimeter. Uh, sorry, a uh, steering, um, uh, uh, the pneumatic trail, which is 10 millimeter here, pneumatic trail, sorry, and then divide by the steering arm on the upright and multiply by what we call here this 40 millimeter there. 
okay it's t rank trailer and so i have 9.73 on the inside well i have less grip uh, and i have less mz because the tire is very unloaded so 0 0.2 instead of nearly 20 so one tenth you have uh, about uh, one fifth one sixth of the lateral grip um, of course uh, the steering rack and the upright have not changed and you have 0 0.75 so if you do the calculation 973 preserve and five that's 1048 that's already way too much to do it so one solution is <laughs> you send uh, you ask uh, uh Schwarzenegger to drive your car or you put power steering and of course power steering is demanding um, uh, power and its weight and it's it, it, it creates more complication no on many race car there is so much downforce that without it you cannot turn the steering wheel and power steering is mandatory i would say not by the rules but necess necessary let's say this way except in IndyCar. IndyCar produces a lot of downforce but didn't have power steering. Ah, now that we have decided um, uh, the kingpin axis angle, the castle trail, the uh, trail uh, view from the front, the scrub bridge view from the side mechanical trail, we need to decide on this axis here where you're going to put the top wishbone and the bottom wishbone pickup point. Okay, so we are going to have a packaging challenge here uh, because we have to look at the tire, the rim, the hub, the bearing around the hub, uh, the brake caliper, the brake disc, uh, maybe some cooling ducts. Oh, it's already pretty uh, cramp over there. You know, uh, you're going to have to be, uh, and, and even worse, if you have an outboard electrical motor, that's not going to make your life easy. But, um, there is one thing that you have to be very careful and a lot of people don't uh, care about that enough that's the distance from the non-suspended mass cg to the kingpin axis why because when you are braking uh, the non-suspended mass is not zero and when you are braking the wheel wants to i'm going to make an, an image here wants to continue forward or when you accelerate they want to go backward relatively to the chassis and that is going to create an mz that is even bigger for this inertial force on the non-suspended mass than the distance between the center of gravity of the suspended mass and the kingpin axis is so you're going to have to be extremely careful with that you try to reduce the distance between non-suspended mass cg and kingpin axis i've seen in formula student people putting here a big inboard electrical motor and the center of gravity went from roughly the center of the wheel to the outside first test they break boom they put the tolling on the front in buckling if if you don't pay, uh, take care about that uh, initial force from lateral and longitudinal acceleration non-suspended mass will create a huge torque around the kimping axis and therefore huge forces on the tollings so you have to be careful with that okay now um little example sorry bad example here what's the problem here you should use the maximum space that you have in the rim so that pickup point should be there and you would like to put that pickup point there and basically the tolling to be nearly perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the car same thing here it's absolutely ridiculous not to use the space in the rim if you multiply if you put that point here you multiply the leverage by five and all things being equal you are going to um uh, have five times less steering um you have a less steering talk same thing here you know this thing should be there by the way okay um so uh, two basic principles try to always have the longest possible steering arm if you look any good race car they always use the maximum space that they have on, in the rim and the upright steering ram will define your steering rack ratio not the other way around so it's only when you have your tire model you know the forces and moment acting on your tire and you have decided the steering arm length that you can decide what's the steering rack ratio ratio that what the steering rack that you want to manufacture or buy and always have the tolling perpendicular to the longitudinal uh, axis of the car ah 
Now we are going to speak about uh, front view kinematics. Okay, you have the wheel like this. So uh, the distance between the instant center and the contact patch is what we call the front view virtual swing axle. And that is the instant center position there that you have to be careful and take into account. And that necessarily the roll center will be here if the suspension is symmetrical. So most, the biggest influence here is that the camber variation in roll and eve will be influenced. So obviously, if you have a very long virtual swing axle, you're going to have minimum camber variation in uh, heave when the car goes up and down. But unfortunately, you're going to have a lot of camber variation in roll. And that's very important. I will explain to you why. So um, uh, the instant center will have also an influence of the tie lateral script. If, if my wheel is here, my instant center is there. OK, but if we put it there, you're going to you're going to have a lot of scrub and that's going to be tire wear and tire temperature in many uh, automotive institute uh, in Europe, in the United States. They um, ask you to uh, diminish your scrub of the tire because they hope that you can do 50,000 kilometers with the same tire in racing. That's different. We change the tire sometime every 100 kilometer and you want to have temperature at the risk of wear. So it's a question, but obviously, if the instant uh, is very high, you're going to have a high roll center. All right. So you have camber variation in heave, in roll, and in steering. Uh, and you, you need to take all of them into account. So camber variation bump. I'm not going to demonstrate the formula here, but the camber variation bump is an arc tangent of H divided by the lateral virtual axle, H being the wheel movement. So if you have a suspension like this with the wishbone parallel like this, the instant center is at the infinite. And therefore, whatever wheel movement versus the chassis, uh, you will not have any camber variation. Well, we know that as the wheel goes up and down uh, or the chassis goes up and down, uh, the convergent will not go to the infinite all the time. They, they could be changes, but um, they will be no instant center, it will always be in the infinite if the top and bottom wishbone are the same length. Now, uh, so if your goal is to decrease the camber variation bump, we need a suspension like that. However, the camber variation roll is uh, the roll angle multiplied by one minus strike divided twice virtual swing axle. I'm not going to demonstrate that formula. That means what? If the car is like this, that's the middle of the car, and you extend the two wishbone, and they meet right edge. That means that the instant center is the middle of the car. Uh, same thing, symmetrical. You're going to have that the half track is the virtual swing axle. So if the half track is equal to virtual swing axle, that uh, parenthesis is 1. 1 minus 1 equals 0. And guess what? You're going to have uh, no camber variation in raw. Is it a good thing? Well, let's discuss that. So um, if you have a long virtual swing axle, this is what's going to happen. You're going to have a lot of camber variation in roll. If you have a sh very short one, you're going to have a lot of camber variation here. So you're going to have to make a compromise. OK, so the circuit. Let's think about formula student. Do you want to um, win uh, uh, the uh, skid path? mainly camber variation roll, a little bit in here because of the downforce. We want to uh, win the acceleration. You don't care about lateral acceleration. You're going to look at uh, mastering your camber variation in acceleration. Uh, it depends on the tire sensitivity because the ideal camber for Michelin is not the ideal camber for Goodyear. Um, so you're going to look at the sensitivity of the lateral grip and the longitudinal grip versus the camber. Um, you're going to have to look at the driving style. Yeah, because if the guy is very sharp. Uh, you, I had an example at Sebring, a guy brake late and turn right. So boom, big camber variation uh, uh, braking, boom, camber variation uh, in roll and steering. And the other guy was kind of trail braking and mixing a little bit the roll, the steering and, and the pitch. Um, that could make a difference also. And then the ambient condition, we are speaking about the track temperature and the tire temperature. And what is it wet or dry condition? So let me give you his very important point here. I'm going to go to Monza 
and I'm going to change the lateral grip here. I'm going to reduce the lateral grip from 155 to 152. So there's a change here of 0 0.03. How much do I need to combat? Oh, but these are the ISO line of the lap time. I forgot to tell you. How much do I need to compensate the reduction of the lateral grip by an increase in the longitudinal grip? Look at that, 0 0.17. So that means that at Monza, 0 0.17 divided by 0 0.3, 5.56, uh, 57, uh, 5.7. That means that the lateral grip is much more important than the longitudinal grip. Um, you're going to tell me, to get the same lap time. Okay, you're going to tell me, oh, Claude, that's Monza, it's a fast track. Well, let's go to Monaco. And that's a little simulation here. And I'm going to look at this. When I change my lateral grip uh, or lose 0 0.5, I need to increase the longitudinal grip by 0 0.16. So you go 0 0.16 divided 3.2. That means that even with a lot of braking in Monaco and Long Beach street circuit, and so with a lot of braking and a lot of acceleration, <laughs> the lateral grip is still four times more important than the longitudinal grip. So, so why am I saying you that? <laughs> what camber variation do you want to uh, uh, look at the most? The one in heave or the one in roll? Okay, I think you start to have a, uh, an idea there that uh, mastering the camber variation in roll is maybe more important. Um, so, you need to understand your tire model. Let's take an example. That's the lateral force with camber equals zero. Let's put two degrees of camber, and you see that you are a winner here and even more a winner there. So um, you have to understand that the advantage of the camber could be bigger at the apex than you are at the entry or the exit of the corner. So in that case, what you do is that you are... Uh, looking at this one, for example, you see more advent ev advantage everywhere on the outside wheel. I'm only looking at one wheel, but bigger on the middle of the corner and the entry. When you have something like this, that's the other way around. You are a winner everywhere, but you are a bigger winner on the entry uh, than in the middle because the camber stiffness, as we call it, the number of newton of lateral grip that you gain per degree of camber. Now, imagine something like this. You have a plus uh, in the middle, but you have a minus in the, uh, in the, entry, uh, in, um, uh, uh, in the entry. So uh, no, that's an inversion. I think that uh, the minus plus has been inverted here. I, I apologize. So you would have a minus here, minus here, and a plus there. Sorry, need to correct that. All right. Um, let me give you a little experience there. This is a tire, uh, a team that we worked with, and um, you could see that there is a lot of graining here. The tire is being cleaned from all the uh, marbles, as we call it, the pickup. And the tire is working decently there. And um, the problem is that they were using a lot of negative camber, a lot of negative camber. And why did they have to lose a lot of negative, use a lot of ne negative camber? Because the virtual swing axle was very long. And when you have a lot of camber variation and because of long virtual swing axle, the roll is going the same direction and nearly equal to, uh, sorry, the camber variation is nearly equal to the roll. So this is after some variation, the uh, virtual swing axle. Look at that. We had too much camber variation in roll. To get a good dynamic camber on the outside wheel, the team had to run a lot of negative camber because they had a lot of variation. Um, and huge tire wear and lots of lots of lots of graining, uh, poor grip, much shorter. No, with a much shorter virtual axle, much less camber variation. You could run uh, less static camber and uh, more lateral and longitudinal grip. So at the end, you were a winner because you had less tire wear. You had even actually better braking because you had more camber variation in pure heave. But you started with so much less negative that dynamically you had even less. So you were win on both sides and less tie wear and much less graining. So you see the climatic influence on the um, tie wear and the distribution of the wear and temperature also. Now, where do you put the, your roll center altitude? Okay, 
um, when you put the roll center high above the ground in the ground. So I'm going to give you a very quick demonstration here. That's your suspended mass in the center of gravity, your non-suspended mass. You're going to have first a non-suspended mass weight transfer. You're going to have a, a non-suspended load transfer. We shouldn't use the word weight transfer, but load transfer. You're going to have a suspended mass, which, uh, suspended mass load transfer that is going to be split in a geometric load transfer and an elastic one. Geometric load transfer and elastic one. So you know that a force applied at one point is equal to a force uh, applied at another point plus a torque. So the geometric weight transfer is there and the geometric weight transfer is going to go through the wishbone for, the, for all the suspension link, while the elastic weight transfer is going to be going through uh, the spring, uh, uh, the bump stop, maybe the entry or bar and into engine the damper. So it doesn't matter. Uh, blue plus red is always, uh, sorry, yellow plus red is always equal to blue. If you put a lower roll center, you're going to have less uh, geometric but more elastic. We call that geometric because who decide the roll center position? The geometry of the car. And why do we call the uh, yellow one elastic? But because it's very recuperated by elastic things like spring, bump stop, and your roll bar damper. Okay. So um, with that in mind, um, I'm going to make a, a, an interesting thing. Huh? I'm going to decompose the outside tire force and inside force and I'm going to, action reaction, of course, and I'm going to decompose that in a geometric weight transfer. And let's not only at the geometric, red up and red down. So for the moment, the red up and the red, the red down are equal. So there is no jacking force. You're going to see that in the next slide. You're going to tell me, uh, so what's the point? Well, ladies and gentlemen, there's something fundamentally wrong on this picture. Is it possible that the green grip is equal to the, her, uh, the magenta one? Is it possible that you could have the same inside and outside trilateral force? No. So let's keep the roll center in the, in the middle. And now let's make more a little bit more sensitive, more grip on the outside, less grip on the inside. Redecompose that. I find my geometry weight transfer on the outside wheel. Ha ha! and the inside wheel, they are not um, uh, equal anymore. So you're going to have a negative, you're going to have a positive, and if you look at this, bada boom, you're going to have some jacking force there. And this jacking force can put the car up or down. Uh, all right, no, that's only, uh, we keep the roll center on in the center. Mm -hmm. Now let's speak put at the roll center moving towards the outside wheel. So let's say the roll center is here. You have the same uh, force variation, and you see that if you look at the geometric weight transfer, you're going to have more geometric up than down. That is going to create a jacking force which is going to lift the car. Mm -hmm. Now let's put the roll center on the inside, of towards the inside wheel, the inside of the corner also. Uh, the roll center moving toward the outside wheel, jacking force, pushing the car. Let's put the roll center towards the inside wheel <clears throat> and look at the decomposition here. You see that actually you have more done than up. And you see that uh, the car is going to be uh, jacked down, which could be an advantage in terms of center of gravity position and definitely right height, then for definitely down force. So um, you, you, have to, uh, you have to be careful with that. There are people saying the roll center should not be moving sideways. Well, when I asked them, I said, why? And said, they tell me, an expert told me that. Then you ask the expert, and the same expert tell you uh, he told me, uh, that he got it from another expert. The people who say that roll center should not be moving are the same people who say that bump steer is wrong. Bump steer could be a good thing because it will help you to have the slip angle you want when you want it. Okay, um, so be careful. The altitude and the lateral movement of the roll center, lateral uh, 
determine the jacking force and the dynamic ride head, which could ride height, sorry, which could influence the iron down force and down force distribution. Now, I'm going to show you an example <clears throat> what the roll center is doing here. Look at that. You have a lateral acceleration. It's an uh, 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 um, open loop. So I increase the uh, I increase the the uh, lateral acceleration decrease. So I take two g here between 0.5 and two for two seconds, and then you have the decomposition here of the force going through the uh, the anti roll bar, the force going through the spring. And you see, by the way, there's a little delay compared to the peak of the lateral acceleration. Why? Uh, because of uh, inertia. The geometric weight transfer is there. And it's interesting because the geometric weight transfer does apparently much more than the spring. That's with a 75 millimeter high roll center. And that's the damper. And you see, of course, that the damper doesn't do anything in the middle of the corner because the roll is uh, maximum, the roll speed is minimum. You roll, then you de-roll. And then you are going to have here uh, uh, the damper, which is much more important. Look at this. If I look at the very beginning of the corner, which could make a big difference, you have 65% of the weight transfer of the non-suspended mass, the load transfer non-suspended mass, which is coming from the geometric and elastic 34. But in this 34.7, the majority is from the damper. So it's telling you that um, the roll center play a big importance at the entry of the corner because that you have a maximum of weight transfer coming from the damper and from the uh, roll center from the geometric weight transfer. You have the same thing here in um, roll center below the ground and except that no, the geometric weight transfer goes to the bottom and um, uh, and then you have the damper, uh, and I look at the percentage here, and you see, no, it's a negative geometric weight transfer, but you still have a majority of it at, in the five first hundredth of a second. Okay, so that's giving you an idea where the roll center should be. Last recommendation, um, uh, what it's going to do in terms of transient behavior. You are know what we call the parallax axis theorem. In Europe, they call it the Steiner for the German, and uh, the Dutch call it the Huygens, uh, Wiggins, as the French are saying, uh, uh, theory, that um, the inertia of, uh, uh, of a solid going uh, through the center, uh, through uh, around another axis, is going to be the inertia uh, of the, the inertia around another axis will be the inertia of um, uh, the complete mass around its own CG plus that mass multiplied by the square of the distance AB. So you have an example here of a car like that. And the longer the distance between the suspended mass CG and the roll center, uh, the more you're going to have inertia because the inertia is going to be the suspended mass around its own center, suspended mass inertia around its own center of gravity, plus the suspended mass multiplied the square of the distance of the uh, suspended mass to the uh, CG to the roll center. There is another way to explain that. You look at the inertia and you multiply by the roll acceleration, but the principle is the same. And guess what? When you have a, a very talented driver, who can uh, have a very uh, responsive car, you need a high roll center, but we have an amateur driver, maybe you want to have a lot of inertia to have a little more stability and less response. Tight circuit, high roll center, uh, more geometric, more quick, more responsive, and uh, low roll center for fast corner. And then depending if you tie a high uh, cornering stiffness, you maybe want to put a low one, why to calm down? Uh, because maybe if you are an amateur driver and the tire is very racy, you need to compensate by a roll center high or the other way, vice versa, vice versa, low, a high roll center with low cornering stiffness and high roll, low roll center for low high cornering. Okay, <laughs> high cornering stiffness, low roll center, low cornering stiffness, high roll center. Okay. 
And last thing I need to explain to you, um, you have to be very careful that the roll center doesn't cross the wheel because if the roll center is here, that's or the roll axis is there, but if the roll center is there, the roll axis is there, the car will be jacking. So at the moment, the roll center cross the wheel, you are inverting the, uh, the, the outside damper is in compression and now they are in rebound. Um, on the other hand, I have no problem. It could be actually an advantage uh, to have the roll center moving laterally, especially towards the inside. Be extremely careful now that you don't have a roll axis which is moving with the front roll center going to the left and the re-roll center going to the right. Not good. All right, let's go further. Side view virtual swing axle um, uh, and also um, uh, instant center height. Um, and that is going to determine many things. So first of all, uh, it will have a wheelbase and caster variation. It's a big debate in Formula One. Now they have very short front virtual swing axle. So there will necessarily be a lot of camb uh, uh, caster variation, which itself could influence the bump steer. And um, uh, pitch center is the same story as the roll center. When you have a high pitch center, you have lower inertia, you have quicker response and probably a higher tight temp temperature uh, because you have a lot of anti-dive, anti-squat, so you put more and more uh, uh, effort in the tires quickly. Now, if you have a low pitch center, you have high inertia, slow response and lower tight temperature. So um, long virtual axle, smaller caster variation uh, in heat, but large caster variation in pitch. And same thing, uh, but the other way around with a short virtual swing axle. Once again, without knowing your tire model, that's going to be very difficult. Now, you see the title of this thing, the anti-anti. <laughs> I'm not a fan of anti-squat, anti-lift, anti-dive, and so on. I'm going to explain to you why. But let's speak about how people are defining that. First of all, you take the axis going from the inboard axis, and the parallel to these axes going for the outboard. Yeah, why in the hell would you speak about the instant center of the wheel by taking pickup point belong to the chassis? You need to take the pickup point there. And so if you go the same way on the rear, you go from the instant center to the contact patch, like this, front and rear, and you find your pitch center. Okay, so pitch center, Contrarily to the front where the roll center is most of the time in the middle of the car, the pitch center is not uh, necessarily in the middle of the car because the rear suspension is not the mirror of the front one. Okay, so be careful here. Uh, let's speak about anti-dive and go through this. You have the contact patch, you have the braking, and you see you brake more with the front and the rear. You have here an instant center, and that is going to define the angle a. Then you're going to have the load transfer, and that load transfer is going to be um, uh, split in a geometric, red, and elastic, yellow. And that is going to be the composition of braking and uh, load transfer. And you are going to have here that force going above the incentive, so it will help the wheel will go up versus the chassis or the chassis down versus the wheel. But if um, this instant center would have been on that line, you can push as much as you want, the wheel will not move. There will still be right eye variation because the tire deflection, but no suspension movement. So uh, that is the angle B. And the one, the way we define the anti-dive is one drop multiplied by tangent A divided by tangent B. Um, and so the angle A is a function of the instant suspension geometry at that moment, because it's going to have to be iterative solution. And the brake distribution load transfer. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you change the distribution between the front and rear braking force, you are effectively changing the angle B, so you change the anti-dive. That is for brakes which are inboard, in the wheels. Okay. If you have outboard brakes, it's the same calculation, but the angle A and B are not the same. So angle B, same thing, function of the instance uh, suspension geometry, angle B, brake distribution load transfer. But look at this. You have now the wheel center there, and I'm going to find the instance center, 
I do the, uh, the line from the instance center to the wheel center because the, you have odd, uh, 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 odd board break. Wait a moment here. I made a, made, no, 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 do, 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 sorry, want to make, no, no, that's, that's, um, uh, that's the other way around. I need to correct that. I do apologize. So I need to correct that very quickly. And I, I'm sorry. Uh, sometimes you still have, um, uh, okay where's my mouse okay so it's here out pro out board breaks and on the next one in board breaks i'm so very sorry guys so in board break is a uh, um in board break sorry i apologize for that so in board breaks uh like this so the brakes are in the chassis near the differential um so let's calculate it now the angle a is not the same you have a uh, uh, breaking force you have load transfer that is going to decompose geometric and elastic same thing and that's going to be the angle b so in the previous example the reference is the ground no it's the uh, longitudinal line the the, the the horizontal line going through the wheel center okay um, and so you're going to have here the same thing. Now, you have to be careful with this because um, when you have a car with um, uh, hybrid, you have brakes in the wheel and you have inboard brakes. So you're going to have to calculate your anti-dive twice. Huh? Very important. And the... Um, so same thing for the uh, uh, anti-lift for example on the rear or uh, this is braking but we could have done it with anti-squat and it's going to be the same thing also okay and why i call that the anti-anti is it funny that when you look at the car view from the front you look at the roll center too but you uh when you look at the side and you speak about anti you look at the front with ignoring the rear and you look at the rear ignoring the front so why in the hell don't you speak about the anti-squat of the outside wheel view from the front and the anti-lift of the inside wheel you cannot look at uh roll center view from the front and ignoring the pitch center on the rear so for me i'm not a fan of this uh this uh, definition of anti-dive anti-lift anti-squat and so on because a car has four wheels and in roll, it roll around a roll axis, and in pitch, it roll around a, a pitch axis. Okay, so let's go back to the main course here. We have discussed, we have here, you um, kingpin axis there, you remember? All the issue of the packaging, there's this side about the caster trail, the mechanical trail, the caster angle, the KB angle. So we decide that the point in red are going to be here, okay? This is the instant center view from the front. This is the instant center view from the side. So do you agree with me that the top wishbone plane will be there from uh, the lower wishbone plane, sorry, will be there and the top wishbone plane will be there inevitably. So uh, because you have an instant axis, you have a top wishbone, one axis and one point define a plane, and uh, you have same thing on the bottom. So on, on the bottom, so necessarily the in the pickup point of you um, uh, wishbone on the chassis will be on that plane. And you remember that uh, a plane is defined by a point and a line, and which is the plane of bottom wishbone pick a point on the upright instant axis same thing for the top wishbone and by definition the plane is described by the following equation ax plus by plus z plus d and you have the inboard uh you have the plane equation you have the outboard so if i have the x and the y is giving me the z if i impose the y because uh i don't know template for example or packaging um and I impose the Z, automatically the X will be given there. 
So it, it, it's, it's depending on uh, what you want, your static kinematic, you issue with packaging, the rules, and so on. But at the end, think about this. Um, the guy who's designing the chassis doesn't care about how much caster angle you put, doesn't. And the guy who is designing the upright doesn't care about what the chassis pick up point uh, is, uh, 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 except that where do they meet? Right there. And uh, uh, that will have a serious influence, by the way, on the uh, point that you have, the, the force that are in you, uh, in your chassis. Uh, so it's interesting. The chassis guys goes toward the wheel. The wheel goes guys goes toward the chassis. Where do they meet? The inboard pick-up point. So that's why you have the two guys need to work together. And you need to know this point before decide, designing your chassis. And the four and the force. And that will be explained in the force module uh, example. Steering rack position. Uh, do you put it ahead or behind? Uh, the front axis. There are plus and minus of that. Um, and you're going to speak also about the Ackerman. Uh, front or rear or front axle, uh, pro or anti Ackerman, high or low mounting. Do you put it high, low, center of gravity uh, could make a difference. And why? So have you already selected the outboard picker point? Okay. Um, to be considered with distribution in inertia, yeah, steering rack more to the inside, uh, spinets, but on a race car, everything is spinets. You, you know, you, there is no magic bullet. It's 200 of a second here and 300 there and 100 there. And at that time, you uh, at the end, you have three or four tenths. Steering column, packaging, template, bump steer, and the bloody compliance, which I will speak about at the end. So, um, Ackerman or Langerspeger, Sperger or Gento, actually Ackerman is the guy who uh, uh, steal, did steal the, uh, all the work made by uh, Langersperger. And actually it was created uh, by Gento, even a French guy, be before even uh, the English and American took care of it. So you can have a, a, an Ackerman, a parallel or reverse, and you're going to say, well, how do you decide it? Well, you cannot do that unless you have uh, your tire model. So this is an example of an Ackermann geometry where the extension of the in the steering arm meet behind. And if you turn the in the left corner, the right wheel 10 degree, the left wheel will, will turn uh, a little bit more, 12, 13. And that is an example here where you look at the anti Ackermann, where when you turn the steering on the right 10 degrees, um, uh, the uh, inside is going to run uh, 8 degrees. So the outside is turning more than inside. How do you make the decision? Well, you need to have a time model. Here's an example where you increase the load uh, from the blue to the brown. You have more and more load. And if you want to use the tide, the peak of the slip angle, you need to be at the peak of the curve. If you have another tire, Michelin tires are often like this, you load the tire more and more, and if you want to induce more and more grip on the tire, you need to more, more and more slip angle. You agree with me, that's the less load the tire, so that's definitely the inside wheel. That is the more load the tire, that's definitely the outside wheel. And you realize that you want to have a more slip angle on the less load the tire inside, and uh, uh, you want more, sorry, slip angle on the inside wheel and less slip angle on the inside wheel. That's a pro Ackermann. No, here, the more you load the tire, the more slip angle you need. And uh, that means that you're going to need more slip angle on the outside than less loaded inside. And that's going to be anti Ackermann. But that's a little bit easy. Okay. Um, there are a way to, uh, in good uh, tire modeling software, to know what's the peak slip angle. So that's an example here where I have uh, uh, the normal load and I have even three different lines depending the inclination angle, which is the camber, different um, uh, nomenclature, different uh, uh, sign convention. But anyway, uh, let's say my load is 400 kilo, 4,000 newton, tak, 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 like this. I have a, a need of slip angle of 7. Uh, 6.8 degrees, something like that. 
So this is an example where um, you have a car at 100 kilometers an hour, you have 36 Newton on the inside wheel, I need a degree of slip angle. And here on the outside wheel, I need 6.7. But if you are at higher speed, 200 kilometers an hour, you're going to look at this, uh, 112,000 Newton, I need 6.7, and here I need 5.9. Okay, so you know what slip angle you, you, you want, if you want the tire to be used at the peak slip angle. Mm -hmm. But, very quickly, there are three causes for the slip angle. One, because you steer the wheel. Number two, because you have a yaw angle, and therefore that changes the wheel. And there is a third one that a lot of people uh, uh, mistaken or ignore sometimes. The gyro uh, will show you that. When you have a car going on a circle in 10 seconds, well, the, your velocity is 36 degrees per second, 360 divided by 10. Okay? And let's look at what that does. Look at this. When you have uh, your velocity like this, you are going to have uh, a tangential force uh, on the rear and on the front and longitudinal force add or retracted. So you have here... Uh, R multiplied by B, B the distance between center of gravity and axle, R, your velocity in radian, and then you have the half track, uh, and the half track on the front and the rear are not uh, necessarily the same, and then you have a tangent speed going down here on the front, which will change the slip angle. So I'm not going to go into detail of that, but at the end you have this formula where if you know uh, the uh, left front uh, if you know, sorry, the front and the rear track, therefore the half track, the wheelbase, the weight distribution, so you know the distance A and B, the CG slip angle beta, the steering angle delta front and rear, you can calculate the front, uh, the two front slip angle. Yeah, but now, if, I'm going to go backward, if you uh, know which slip angle you want here with which camber, then you can calculate the steering angle uh, 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 that you need. So here, <clears throat> we're going to go the other way around, where the, the target here of the slip angle are becoming an input, and here the steering angle are becoming output. So be careful because you have to do that for many different speeds, many different new angles. But it's going to give you an idea, okay? So um, you're going to have to make that calculation at different slip angle, uh, different speed, different radius, different yaw angle to find the ideal steering left and right, inside, outside. Uh, be careful now because you can have a given Ackerman. Uh, the initial toe is a big part of it, and you're going to carry this initial toe in or out. Uh, so Ackermann is a variation, but what count is the dynamic slip angle? So what's the static slip angle that you start with? Grip and balance are going doing two different things. You could do such a good job exploiting in any condition the front slip angle, the tie at the ideal slip angle that the driver could be yelling at you. <laughs> Why? Because the front are going to be too good and the rear doesn't follow. So you have to be careful. Grip Exploitation of slip angle is a good idea, but balance is another one, okay? And all this cal calculation, you have to be careful, is going to be, uh, are going to be washed away once you take the compliance into account. Nothing is rigid. Um, remember also that there are other sorts of compliance. FX, uh, if, I, if I have a, a lot of steering on the inside wheel, they're going to have a lot of FX yawing the car, and the MZ also. So. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult than you want. That being said, it makes a big difference, I guarantee you. Um, take a formula student, try different pro, parallel, and anti-Ackerman, and ask the student to push the car on the skid pad. You will see the difference, huge. All right. Ah, that is a mistake that a lot of people are doing. Um, Non-linear steering ratio, like this, you're going to have to take into account that the angle are uh, correctly assembled. That's a bad example. That's a, a good example. There are very good information there on the steering column angle that you can find on uh, Google. And the correct phasing. And, you know, if you put the uh, 
the, the Cardan, the CV John like this or like that, you are going to have a very big difference. And that is going to play a bad role on the uh, steering ratio. So let me show you a, a bad and a good example of real car. You have an example where you have in uh, blue the KNC and in red the simulation. So pretty good. The simulation is giving you uh, something correct. And then we vote in, in intermediate chart. On the passenger car, it's very difficult because uh, steering column, you know, when you go to the steering wheel to, uh, towards the steering rack, you have an engine, you have a especially traversal engine. So you need to have an intermediate shaft. So without the intermediate shaft, you would be a perfect uh, situation. Direct connection between steering and steering rack. Mm -hmm. Just by changing the inclination of the steering wheel, you change that steering ratio. That is bad. When you have this kind of variation, the, 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 the the tire, I'm not speaking to the driver, is very uh, discontinuous there, very bad. So let me show you a better one where KNC simulation and uh, with and without intermediate shaft, you have something very, very constant. I implore you to look at that. It's going to make a big difference in the driver control and confidence. Um, that's another one that you're going to have to take into account. Let's say that I'm going to lock the chassis. I'm going to put two die gauges uh, on the left and the right wheel on, at the rim. And I'm going to put the torque. Normally, in a perfect world, the only thing which should be changing is twisting the tire. <clears throat> Look at that. You're going to be uh, scared. Look at this. This is at zero torque. You have... Uh, something like 0.6 degree tow in tow out and so on but as soon as you steer the wheel you see the variation there and not only there is a variation but there is a hysteresis it's not the same when you turn or deturn the steering wheel so I, I implore you to be careful with that last thing last few things motion ratio very important um, uh, that's the ratio between the spring and the damper uh, movement uh, the spring damper or, or damper, most of that they are the same. So let me give you an example here. The wheel rate, which is the effect that that spring has on the wheel, and that wheel that wheel um, uh, spring um, uh, has. A, I have a phone ringing here. Yeah, there. Yeah. Hold on. No, it's here. My cell phone is ringing. Sorry. It's going to stop very quickly, I guess. Sorry. Thank you. Sorry. Um, um, okay. The wheel rate is the effect that that spring has at the wheel, and it will be in series with the tire rate. So let's say my motion ratio is 0 0.9, and my wheel rate will be 11.5 divided by 0 0.0 squared. No, I'm going to put 0 0.9 squared, 14.2. Let's put a softer spring. Yeah, but if the old spring has the same free length and you don't change the suspended mass, guess what? You are going to compress the spring. That means that you are moving the uh, rocker. And that means that you have now uh, a motion ratio of 0 0.8. And if I do the wheel rate calculation is spring divided the square of the motion ratio. Ta-da! Look at that. You have a softer uh, spring but you have a stiffer suspension. Be very careful with that. Okay. So by decreasing the stiffness of the spring, you could have actually an increased wheel rate. Okay. Uh, variable road motion ratio, rocker ratio, A and B. Here you can see that when the rocker is moving, the ratio A divided by B is nearly the same. Okay. And um, here uh, A divided by B uh, is very, very different. Okay, you have something extremely different there. And that could be a good thing because you could use the motion ratio um, variable to have a stiffer and stiffer car as you go uh, faster and faster. So you soft car for mechanical grip at low speed, the car goes down, stiffer car with the same spring uh, to resist the downforce. So it could be used to obtain a rising rate uh, wheel rate. So it could be a good thing if you know what you are doing, okay? All right, anti-roll bar motion ratio. Uh, when the wheel goes up, you are going to twist the anti-roll bar. 
So you have a, a ratio here of h, wheel movement, divided by little d, uh, anterior bar motion ratio. Some people could do that, but I have a problem with that because if you have a u bar, and which displacement are you going to have? Uh, vertical or tension? Well, if you want your bar is like that, you're going to move like this or like, like that, it's going to move like that. So I'm a little bit not happy with that um, ratio between wheel movement and the edge of the leverage of the anterior bar movement. Now, if you have another solution here is to use the roll angle versus the anterior bar angle. So in other words, when I roll one degree, how much do I twist my anterior bar? I prefer that solution. Um, now, be careful because the anterior bar stiffness could be uh, expressed in Newton per millimeter. Sometimes they put force in Newton per degree. Dallara is doing that. I still don't get it. They have even kilo per degree of torsion. Or they have Newton meter per degree. But be careful that if you are using F uh, force, which is um, uh, versus a displacement, then the motion ratio must be wheel movement divided by anterior bar edge movement. If you are using Newton meter per degree to characterize the uh, anterior bar stiffness, you need to use degree per degree of roll angle versus anterior bar angle. Finally, integration of vehicle design. Um, you need to know in this example, that's a professional car, that the bottom wishbone outboard pickup point, the low, low boy, uh, the, the low bone of the, 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 the push road pick up point of the on the wishbone, the top point of the push road on the rocket, the center of the rocket, the position of the damper on the rocket, the position of the damper on the chassis, and also the droopling position on the rocker and the anterior bar, all this thing must be on the same plane. Why? To avoid compliance. Because if your rocker is like this, pivoting around that axle, and you have a push road like this, of course you're going to bend the push road. That's not very smart. Okay. And I'm going to give you a bad thing that I've seen and good thing that I've seen in Formula Student, to get an example of Formula Student. Um, uh, uh, same thing. Uh, you need to know that uh, the push road must be, sorry, the, the, the little circle should be there uh, from the outboard pinnacle joint. Uh, that is no, not good because here you have the pull road, uh, which is not going through the center of the ball joint. That's guaranteed. If this thing is going to break, it's going to be right here. Let me give you a do and don't do. Let's start with don't uh, do. That's sorry. That's pick a point arriving at the uh, node of the chassis, less compliance, that is a no, 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 no. You have the rock, the, the, the damper in the middle of the tube and you have the anchorage of the rocker in the middle of the tube. That is a, a, a yes, double shear, a single a double shear, that is a no. In Formula Student, by the way, that is not allowed anymore. You uh, tolling must be uh, double she on the upright. Conclusion. Um, this is the way you're going to work. Track and wheelbase, scrub and make, reduce mechanical tray, caster angle KPI trail, outboard pickup point, roll center, pitch center, inboard pickup point on the chassis, steering rack position, which influence uh, the Ackerman, and also the bump steer and uh, you're going to have to refine the loop. The one thing that you need to know is that we didn't discuss how we have to put the tolling to avoid the bump steer or to have the bump steer you want. That is going to be discussed in one of the next sessions about optimization. So that's it, guys. Thank you very much. And I think we have, Ola, we have a lot of questions here. So, um, okay. Why do rear wheel need to have a caster angle? Uh, you don't necessarily need to have one, but you have to understand that um, if you have anti-dive and anti-squat, the wheel will not go up and down. 
So if you have anti-dive and anti squat there will be variation of the caster. And what count is the dynamic caster, not the static one. So you want to kind of uh, take that into account for your caster angle. Remember also that the caster angle on the rear, the KP angle on the rear, the scrub radius and the mechanical trail will influence the torque that you have around the kingpin axis which is going to influence forces on the tolling and therefore on the upright and on the pickup point inboard of the tolling of the uh, suspension uh, of the chassis sorry um, uh, shifting the outboard tow out to the center of the tire will increase the amount of rotation made by steer or can we counter this shifting the outboard tolling to the center of the tire Why would you do that? Shifting the odd port toe link point to the center, ah, for the rear suspension. Uh, uh, I, I don't know, I'm not sure, I don't understand that question. If it's for the front, it's very clear that you want maximum uh, steering arm leverage. So you want to use all the space that you have on the rim. So you want to have the longer one. So the toe link uh, on the odd board should be as far as possible from the wheel center. If, um, I don't understand it, I, and same for the rear. I, shifting the outboard toe point to the center of the tire would increase the amount of rotation angle made to steer. At the rotation angle of the steering wheel, yeah. Right. How do you come to that? Put a good steering ratio and calculate the steering ratio after having tried to make the longest, um, uh, uh, the longest, um, uh, steering arm. Last question I have here is that apart from the obvious effect of aerodynamic, are there uh, any downside of upward jacking force? Well, yes, because if you have, okay, I'm going to take an example. I go on the scale, I measure my weight, okay, then I put two um, weight in my hands of 10 kilo, okay. So my weight is 20 kilo, 10 kilo in each end. So my weight is already 20 kilo more, okay? And if I move the uh, wheel, at the, my arm up at constant speed, the scale will still measure my normal weight plus 20 kilo. But if I do this, in other words, there is a variation of the speed, you are going to have an acceleration. And this inertial, for, and you're gonna see on the scale that there is a variation of the load momentarily. Um, so um, uh, the, uh, the jacking force will increase or decrease depending where your roll center is in altitude and lateral position, uh, the vertical load on the tire, you have to take that into account. So apart the obvious effect on aerodynamic, are there any downside of upward jacking force? Well, the other one is that you're gonna put your roll center higher. A lot if you have soft spring, a little if you have stiff spring. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, no. Definitely. Okay, good. So I want to, uh, some of the answer that uh, uh, have been asked have been uh, uh, given by um, Ariel uh, online. Um, I want to, uh, we have more questions there? Okay, sorry. All right, so uh, thank you. Um, the A arm of the suspension need to mount either vertical or horizontal, like the picture in slide 11. Okay, we're gonna go to, I need my glasses here, slide 11. Boop, 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 boop. Slide 11. 11, 11. Hmm. The A arm of the suspension need to be mount either vertical or I, I mean I guess you speak about the road end being uh, like this or like that, like the picture on slide eleven. I, I don't see the I have one if I have one vertical mount and one horizontal mount. I'm not sure what you mean by vertical and horizontal. I guess you speak about the road end. Well, when you put the okay, let's say this is your chassis. If you put your road end like this, there will not be any missile in mind. 
But if you put your rod in like that and you have a look, look of movement at a certain time, the spherical joint then is going to be bending. So you need to take into account if you don't have enough uh, misalignment angle potentially in the road end, then it's good to put the steering arm, uh, the sorry, the road end uh, of with the plane, let's say par nearly perpendicular to the. Well, yeah, Eric said it's not on slide eleven; it's on page sixty-nine. Oh, and on page sixty. Nine, like this one. Oh, uh, this point here. Well, I think I, uh, I answered that question in that case. Uh, that's that's the number one uh, solution that I'm thinking. Uh, ah, <laughs> is Mr. Ruel going to Formula Student Hungary this year? I hope so. I already have a busy, busy schedule. And uh, do we need caster at the rear? I answered that question uh, previously. Uh, from another person if the dynamic caster variation is, is let's say 0 0.3 degree in the rear the static uh, uh, caster need to be adjusted enough to take into account guys you have to understand that if you have caster variation when the wheel goes up and down that means you pick a point when the car is not only going up and down it's turning that means you modify the outboard point of the tolling that means you are creating bump steer if that is not taken into account be very careful huh? you need to look at the car view from the front camber variation heave and rolling steering you need to look at the car view from the side camber very uh, wheelbase variation and caster variation but you also need to look at the car view from the top how much do you have um uh bump steer uh, once again, bump steer is not necessarily a big, a bad thing. It could help you to have the the slip angle you want when you want, but uh, that's not good on bumpy track. On bumpy track, then the slip angle keep changing, and and and, and the tire doesn't know where it needs to be. Uh, but on the smooth circuit, it could be a good thing. So you have to look at that. Um, more question here. Thank you for all your question, guys. I appreciate that. When calculating the motion ratio of the pusher, it should be calculated from the LB lower. Uh, or no, 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 no. A motion ratio is okay. Let, let me. Uh, it's good that we are speaking about that here when we speak about it. that. Is the not the motion ratio? That's the rocker ratio. And the rocker ratio is um, one of the element in the chain of the motion ratio wheel versus spring and damper so the you have the wishbone the top wishbone the tolling uh the um uh, the the kpi believe it or not the, the kpi will influence your motion ratio so when I, my wheel <clears throat> goes up x millimeter how much is my spring moving y millimeter that's the motion ratio uh you you everything has to be taken into account you cannot calculate the motion ratio by looking at the top or the bottom, bottom which more vertical movement is kpi necessary and why the consequent zero kpi well i'm going to that good question good good question if you kingpin axis go through the center of the contact patch that means the fx whether it's braking or acceleration, will not create an MZ. So look at that. Uh, you are in the, in, let's say you are in a, not a Formula One, not a, a single seater car, you are in covered, covered wheel car. You turn the steering wheel and one of the wheel is locking and you don't see it. You don't, you don't see the wheel, the wheel is locked and you are not going to feel any difference in the steering wheel. So you need, a, it's like the, the caster trail, the mechanical trail. You don't want too much of it, because if you have too much FY multiplied by a long mechanical trail, or too much FX multiplied by a long scrub radius, you're going to need Schwarzenegger to turn the steering wheel. If you have a too small one, then you don't feel any reaction. So it's all about the steering torque, guys. It's all about the steering torque. You don't want no steering torque and you don't want 
too much steering torque. Try to get four, five, six, seven newton meter. That is designing NDFX, NDFY versus the caster trail and versus the scrub radius will make a difference. So that's the question about is the KPI necessary? Can you show some example of some geometry which can be implemented to quickly change the camber on the track rather than those? Can you show some example of some geometry which can be implemented to quickly change the camber on the track rather than those treaded rodents? Yeah, of course, shims. Guys, we'll, we'll go on the internet. The shims. You put shims and the, the, that's going to change the, the camber. No. That's an interesting question, which is going to make you think. Think about that. You have a given camber. That's your top wishbone. Okay. So let's turn the road end and make the top wishbone shorter, but put more shims and you come back to shorter wishbone, more shims, same static camber. Yeah. Except that now you change the KPI uh, angle. And the KPI angle will have an effect on the steering torque. And the KPI angle will have, I was surprised, I learned that 15 years ago, I was very surprised how much the K, a variation in the KPI, KPI angle changed the motion ratio. Yeah, because your upright you now is moving uh, with a same length bottom wishbone, the shorter one on the front. So it's gonna change your motion ratio. I was very surprised. And do not forget the wheel rate is the motion ratio divided by the spring divided by the motion ratio square square that means if you change your motion ratio 10 percent you change you will rate 21 percent because square of 1.1 is 1.21 okay so i think uh ariel do we have more questions two more uh, two more questions as i'm waiting for the question let me put a little bit of advertising here um we are going, if you go to the Optim MG website, we're going to have um, several seminars. Uh, we are going to have two applied vehicle dynamic seminars, one in Eindhoven, beginning of April, uh, Eindhoven in the Netherlands, at TU Eindhoven, and one at Michigan State University in May. So beginning of April, Eindhoven, and uh, Michigan State University, um, in that case, just after Formula Student Competition. Now we're going to have one two three four five data driven engineering semi data driven performance engineering the applied vehicle dynamic seminar is i would say seven seventy percent of theory and thirty percent of practice and the data driven is that we're going to give you data of real car and we are you are going to make kpi key performance engineering from the data acquisition that is about 65% mm, practice and 35% theory. And you need to come with your laptop. And ahead of time, we will send you data so that you can practice that. And we will be using the MoTeC system. Why? Because MoTeC is free of charge and software. So it makes things easier. And we will send you ahead of the seminar so that you can practice. Now, uh, last question. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I think it's this one. Yeah. I want to know what's the way to I can calculate the spring rate and what's the parameter I need to add the spring rate to get... Uh, yeah, okay. So, ah, okay. I'm going to repeat the question in a simple way. Do you want a heavy, a stiff spring or a soft spring? And my answer is I cannot discuss that in the uh, kinematic march. This is much bigger. If I want you to explain that to you, uh, I'm going to need one hour because there are so many important things. But I'm going to say it in a simple way. Um, when you test a car, go stiffer and stiffer and stiffer in the spring and the end your bar until the driver will tell you, I cannot handle it. Then you go one step backward. Do not forget, though, that the critical damping is 2 square root of K multiplied by M. So that means when you increase your spring 5%, I don't care too much. If you increase the spring 50%, then the damper is not following. Okay. So if you want a good um, critical damping, uh, uh, damping ratio, uh, 0.7 would be, I don't say the car will be perfect, but it's a good way to start. You're not going to be stupid on the racetrack. 
or test track. So if you increase the spring, uh, you need to increase the damping by ratio of square of that variation. Right? The damper need to go there. But that, that's my, um, and you, you need to calculate the frequency, the critical damping and so on. Uh, so it's a, it, it's a simple question, it's a longer answer, which is not purely kinematic. Uh, if you want to know more, maybe you want to come to the, one of the seminars that I will be. And by the way, the seminars are only until the end of spring. We're going to come with more seminars in the summer and uh, the fall. Uh, is it necessary that ARM linkage on front end wheel should be in line? In line with what? Is it necessary that ARM linkage of front and rear should be in are inside you? Well, good question. If your wishbones are parallel to the ground, your instant center uh, is on the infinite for the front wheel, is on the infinite on the rear wheel, and then where is your pitch center? Uh, you know one thing, it's on the ground because you go from the instant center to the contact patch, which will be a parallel to the inboard axis parallel. So the pitch center is on the ground, but where is it? <laughs> you cannot calculate that unless you know the spring stiffness, okay? Um, take a beam like this, two spring under the beam, same stiffness. You push in the middle, the beam will uh, move parallel to itself. Put a sp stiffer spring on the rear and push in the middle, you will create heave and pitch. Okay, so uh, kinematic is one thing, but kinematic is good, is important, but it's not the solution to every problem. It's a good solution. To be honest with you, uh, Archimedes said, um, give me a leverage and a point where I can put the leverage and, uh, and the arm long enough and I will lift the world. Um, in school, you remember that you uh, define a force by an application point, a direction, and an intensity. I would worry if I was you more about the application point and the direction before you uh, worry about the intensity. And I'm going to tell you, I've been working on race car where we change the spring, the anterior bar, the tire pressure, the toe, the caster, and so on. Practically nothing. And suddenly we change the pickup point, a few pickup points by 5 10 millimeters. Bada boom, the car starts to be working. So I don't say kinematic is more important than iron make or load transfer, spring, damper, tire pressure. I don't say that. I say it's an essential thing. And that's one of the things that you should uh, discuss before you all, uh, work on the, um, on the spring stiffness. Voila, les amis, any more question? Okay. So I would like uh, you to make sure Ariel come here so that you will, they will see your face. Okay, so this is Ariel, who will Hello, be guys. It will be at uh, my. Uh, you want to lower yeah. a little bit, maybe? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll be at your place. And next week. Ariel, what mm -hmm. are we going to speak in the next three yeah. weeks? Yeah, next week we are going to speak about optimal kinematics. So, how do you put everything that you learned today and everything that learned uh, that Claude presented? How do we put that in practice, and how do we? use optimal kinematics to get the most out of your car. So I think that's all. Okay, the next one will be for Smoodle? No, the, yeah, the first one is going to be optimal kinematics standard, you know, how to run simulations, uh, how to view your roll centers, your pitch centers, and so on. The second one, which will be two weeks from now, will be about the forces module. And the last one will be the latest development, which is the optimization module which is the most powerful kinematics tool that we have today. Okay, guys. Well, I wish you um, uh, uh, a good year. I wish you that um, you're going to have a good season, whether it's in racing um, or in Formula Student. And even I think that for passenger cars, some of the advice uh, I shared with you. I I'm going to say one more thing. Uh, compliance. All kinematics will be uh, purpose, a design will be ruined by compliance, inevitably. Um, and I want to tell you, there is no such things as a little bit of that is compensated a little, uh, a little bit of that, that, one into the other. You cannot compensate uh, by the kinematic a bad compliance. It can only 
go worse. Uh, <laughs> as one of my uh, teacher in mechanics said, uh, uh, the gods are against you. Don't expect that the compliance will be a patch on a bad kinematic. It, they, they, the gains are good. They, they go against you both. Okay, so be careful about it. All the compliance very, very important. Okay, thank you guys, and I will see you uh, uh, later uh, on the circuit and uh, with Ariel next two week and the next two weeks after that uh, for optimum kinematic uh, uh, 